All right. Hi, I'm Vaughn Miller, Deputy Fire Chief of Ventura County Fire Department, and I really appreciate being a part of this discussion. I'm going to provide you a, a look from a, su a suppression agency's perspective at uh, our now record fire in California, the Thomas Fire. I got to start my presentation by just saying, you know, it feels like we're uh, the best that we've ever been at fire suppression, especially in California, where I can really speak from an expert expert level. We also have a pretty uh, pretty good fire prevention and fuels program here, and yet we have had the largest fire in recorded history at the same time. So it just feels like things are pulling in different directions. I'm going to give you first. I'm going to tell you a little bit about us, and then we'll go into the a brief story of the fire. So we're right outside of Los Angeles. I'm going to get a little laser pointer here up for you so you can kind of see. There's Los Angeles and there's us. We're a largely suburban, white collar, blue collar community, a little less than a million people. We live with fire out here in California. We're pretty well known for our major fires every October. And you can see by this map, this is a map of the last 30 years of fire history in Southern California. Uh, again, Los Angeles is right in this area and Ventura is right here. We have, uh, we have some scars for sure. This is, this bright red is the latest scar of the Thomas fire. And you can see, I'll go back to the previous slide. It fills a nice little spot, a little patch of what used to be green in our landscape. This happens in Southern California in the fall, usually uh, because we have Santa Ana winds. And this is a slide I obtained from the National Weather Service, who is really a fantastic partner at predicting these things. But very simply put, when it snows in Denver, it blows in Los Angeles. I mean, that's the, <laughs> the simplest way I can put it. When there's a high pressure pushes down on the air mass in Denver, uh, the exhaust is in Southern California. And if you look right here where this down, this ridge is, and you can see the diagram of compression of the winds and over here on the lower right side of the screen. So the, the winds get stronger, the closer they get to the coast and they get warmer and they get drier. So if you look at this ridge right here, where I'm showing you, I'm gonna go back a slide and just say this mountain range right here is that ridge traditionally for Southern California. And so we have the topography that lends itself to supporting a very strong wind um, in the fall and a very dry, hot wind. And we're on the tail end of a, a long drought in uh, California. And that's um, also added to our problem but as I said, we're no stranger to fire. The largest out of the top 11 fires in California in size, we've had the top three in Ventura County. So this is something we do. Our normal responses, we do about 150 fires every year. Only about you know, less than 10 every year get above 10 acres. So we're very good at suppression. We hop on them very quickly and uh, we keep them uh, very small, except our problem is when the wind wind really pushes it, and that's what you'll hear with the Thomas fire. This is a just a diagram of our layout. All the, I guess, blue and red are fire stations. What I want to call your attention to is the green. About half our county is forest, and about half of it, the lower half, is a populated area. And now the white half is the area that my fire department protects. But we work with the Forest Service all the time, and we routinely go into the forest to assist them in fighting uh, fires in the forest, and they routinely come down into our area and help us fight our fires. And we're pretty normal as far as any jurisdiction. We have a, a, a wide diversity of agencies and um, challenges uh, in response and protecting our population. And wildfire is just one of them for us. This is an overlay of the Thomas fire on our jurisdiction. So you can kind of see the scope and size of the fire related to our normal coverage area. It's uh, just it's huge. So it burned right through and right in 
are populated area, highly populated areas. So this isn't this isn't um, rural area. This is these are large communities with um, you know thousands and thousands of people in them. We like uh, most agencies in California have a very good uh, fire hazard re reduction program. It's mandatory. So if we select your parcel for clearance, you must clear up to 100 feet, up 100 feet away from any habitable or valuable structure. And if you don't, we come on, we can legally come on your property and we've done this to clear that, that vegetation. And we do that. And if your neighbor's parcel, even though the structure is not on the neighbor's parcel, uh, we still can get on that property and clear 100 feet from the structure of value. So property ownership doesn't really matter. It matters about clearance. And we do about 16,000 parcels every year, and we get 100% compliance. We do this pretty standard in California. It feels like in the summertime like we're all one big fire department. So we do a ton of um, interactive training with all fire agencies out there. We actually train with law enforcement too. We have a good, good coordination in our uh, state at the state level in the Office of Emergency Services, and we have a very good local um, office as well. We hold several public events to increase awareness on the threat of wildfire through the season. So this is something we do every single year, and we um, we take it very seriously and put a lot of resources to it, especially in the spring and summertime when our season really begins. But I think as Tanya said, I mean, the season's definitely grown by three months, at least for us, our fire season really ha didn't end, uh, hasn't ended in a few years. We saw this coming. So this is something that happens here in California. We, like I said, we have a great uh, weather service out here and they predict the Santa Ana winds we know what they are, and you heard my little moniker about when it snows in Denver, we know what's coming. So we saw this thing coming. We routinely staff up resources and coordinate and, and increase our level of coordination when we have one of these weather events out here. And so four days before the Thomas fire, we did that. We were notified by the weather service that we were gonna have a really good blow. We were coordinating with our partners. We talked about our upstaffing. We planned to upstaff the day of the, the predicted event. Um, I had the duty which was responsible for that coordination and uh, operational assignment of resources throughout the region, the area here. And we held everybody home as far as travel goes. We had several of our uh, managers were leaving to go to various classes and we held them all back. So. I guess what I want to say at the end of the day, we we were probably as ready as we've ever been for a predicted wind event um, as what was forecasted. The day of the Thomas fire, the winds came as predicted uh, Monday morning, and they blew hard all day, and nothing happened all day long. At 6.20 p.m., if you want to, if you're a brush fire and you want to consume a bunch of land, you're going to start right where this Thomas fire did at right at this time. At the end of the day, during at the beginning of nightfall when we can't get a fixed wing aircraft and we have limited capabilities with night operations with uh, helicopters, visibility is, is poor, people are coming home and they're kind of tucked into their homes at night. So you have a decreased level of awareness from the civilian population and you definitely have a degraded response uh, from aviation, our aviation resources at night. So this diagram is back to our map and I got my little pointer here. This arrow is where the start occurred. You can see these blue arrows here. They're the direction of the, the Santa Ana wind as it comes through the county. This happens uh, normally. So the fire started here outside of Santa Paula, and we all knew immediately when, where it started and when it started that it was, and with the first reports of, you know, something visible that it was going to move quickly out of there. And we, like I said, we were all ready. We, a lot of our uh, higher level overhead got out there quick and set up a command post in Santa Paula and started preparing Santa Paula for structured defense. And Santa Paula is right here. There are about 40,000 
uh, civilian population out in this area and then houses extend all up and down this road. So we're out there doing structured defense as fat, you know, getting there as fast as we can, but this fire is moving, moved very quickly through this terrain and into this, um, this area, which is a very large fuel, fuel bed of ranch land and open, open range. It's all chaparral, it's all type four fuel. And there are tons of ranches out there and it got into there immediately and started skipping across some of those canyons. We almost immediately had a problem out there in this place called Wheeler Canyon. And right as we were dealing with this problem, which I'll tell you about in a minute, we had another start up here in Upper Ojai at the second arrow. And that fire um, got with the program right away as well. Um, there, you won't see the map grow quite as quickly on that fire as the um, the lower fire, just because our our situational awareness and our resources were predominantly deployed to the south fire to the bottom fire, just because of the vast amount of populated area down here. Uh, this area is sparsely populated. It's a rural area and ranch homes, very nice ranch homes. And we lost uh, quite a few structures up there. We deployed about 20 fire engines up there uh, before they actually got cut off here by the fire and couldn't get up there. And then we had numerous rescue problems in these canyons here almost immediately and I'll, I'll just stop right here and say that we have about uh, 56 fire engines in the county that's on duty every day. We staffed up a number, another 10 fire engines that day as well. I think we had almost all of them on the fire at, at some point within the first three or four hours. Um, there was only just very skeletal coverage back um, in the cities. Uh, but once we, once we deploy all our resources in Ventura, we have to go to our partners, which we do normally, but there's a, definitely a time lag with that. And so it's not, it's fairly normal for even resources coming out of Los Angeles or Santa Barbara to take a couple hours just to get deployed and get up here and help us out. So, you know, we're, it hit us hard and hit us very quickly. Uh, in this little area where there's a red dot, there was a, um, a car ac accident where a, one of the evacuees ran off the road, which is pretty common in a smoke condition. Unfortunately, her car got struck as well, and uh, it caused a chain reaction uh, accident where there was um, a, it, nobody else could get out of the canyon. So we deployed, we had fire engines in the area up there, and we ended up sheltering most of the residents up here in uh, corrals while the fire blew by. As you can see, we massed, we massed resources here in Santa Paula, but with the next slide, it, you can see where it's going. It's going right to basically Ventura. However, about 9 p.m., about two hours into the start, it burnt through some major transmission lines to the area and the power went out where all the shaded area is in our area. So probably, you know, half our half our population was without power, and even up to Santa Barbara, which is up to the north, and it's off the screen to the to the right. Um, and that really, if you're trying to get people out of the way, which is the first thing we really try to do, we we start evacuations in Ventura. But if your power's out, you're trying to get people up out of bed at night, and um, that's you're you're talking to people a lot of confusion. Uh, they can't get their cars out of their garages. We had a, so many people just walking away from their homes and walking down the street. We deployed fire engines in the neighborhoods and we were putting people in, <laughs> we were putting people in other people's cars and telling them to get out. And we were putting them in our fire engines and getting them out, dropping them off on a corner where it was safe and going back and getting more. Law enforcement was basically doing the same thing. So this is all within uh, probably two or three hours of the fire start. The size of the fire with the shaded areas probably 10 to 15,000 acres in the first hour and a half to two hours. The third arrow right here is the third start. We had a separate start over here at the end and that it merged with the main body of the fire fairly quickly. So, but again, more confusion. You have people thinking that fire is coming this way and then you have another fire starting over here where it instantly grows to, you know, a huge size We and it's, you divert some, some resources to it but you're really, at this point, we're just trying to get people out of the neighborhoods as best we can. It burned in Ventura, and the story has been told. It burnt uh, 
over a thousand structures, about 600 in Ventura itself, and this is within just hours of it starting. So there weren't, there were, there's no way there were enough fire trucks to to defend homes in this area, and it just got bigger. That was the first night. The next day, it burnt into other fuel beds, and I'll just kind of wrap up my presentation with um, just a few slides on scope and magnitude. This part of the perimeter is just after the first night this fire burnt for 20 over 24 days it had more to it had more terrain to eat and it this train you know doesn't these are huge fires in and of themselves um, from our perspective this is a very abnormal situation we were all shocked and we've been here you know our entire careers fighting fires so uh, the fuels behaved in a way that we've not seen. We lost homes days into this fire, which is not really okay <laughs> because we have adequate resources on site, but we're the fuels were really, really volatile. Uh, ornamental shrubbery was burning in front of people's homes and the ember showers were incredible, catching homes on fire. People were opening their doors, embers were flying in, they closed their door, house on fire. In all in all, we evacuated, we had 31 evacuations, almost 100,000 people moved, definitely 30,000 people the first night, almost 20,000 structures threatened, 1,300 damage or destroyed, huge cost, tremendous cost, and, you know, that's just dollars, you know, the emotional toll is huge, and, you know, I'm sure the discussion will, will go to that at some point. We lost one of our own, which is was terrible. Corey was doing what he thought he could do, and the fuels and the weather uh, surprised him, just like they surprised us, and he lost his life. And then, if that wasn't enough, it rained five days later after the fire was over. And that story's been told as well. You know, almost 500 homes destroyed by a, an incredible weather event. So I'll just wrap up and I just want to avail questions to questions from the group, but you know, I've got some lessons learned that I can offer you. First off, if you think you're gonna fight a fire of any serious magnitude um, without knowing who your partners are, you're not gonna be successful. You have to make sure that you do the, your preseason work. Uh, we're seeing the need to respond with more, more, more and more resources faster than we ever have before. Information is critical and to share it um, is, the need is immediate. Uh, I don't, we have a good alert system here and uh, it could be better. It, it, and I can definitely talk, speak to it um, in the question period. And, and I don't believe that public service can do everything. I think that there's a lot of capability out there from the private sector that can help us. And I just, CAD, situational awareness, technology is a key area where um, the private sector can really come up and help the public sector improve. So those are some points I have. I'm glad to open up for questions, hand it back to you, Layla. Thank you.